Good morning and uh, welcome to Sask Organics Mixing It Up Cover Cropping and Intercropping webinar. Um, we're really pleased that you're here and happy uh, to announce that we have 61 uh, folks who have registered um, and are online. So thank you all for being here this morning. Um, I'm just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping before um, I introduce the panel. And I'm not going to read it all um, all out because it's there for you uh, to see, but it's just talking a little bit about those controls that you'll see on your screen. So the important bits for today are the question. So you'll see the red arrow pointing to that question mark. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask um, of uh, either presenter or SASP Organics, please put your questions um, in that question box. Um, and then there's also um, a chat function. And if you can use that, um, please, or if you have other technical questions or questions not related to the webinar, um, please uh, uh, use the, the chat function rather than the question function. But if you use one or the other for you know the, a different purpose, we'll, we'll find you and, and we'll, we'll take care of you. Marla, sorry yes. to interrupt here. Oh, we can't see your, your slide. Are you sharing your screen? Uh, you know, we even did, um, how's that? There you go, we can see it now. <laughs> <laughs> we even did a practice run, so we didn't do that. And so uh, Martin and Will are going to be perfect. And so I've made, I've made the, uh, <laughs> the error here this morning. Thanks, Deb. Um, no problem. So uh, we'll start by uh, thanking our uh, gold sponsor, Grain Millers. Uh, we can't uh, put on the events that we do, whether online or in person, with without our sponsors. So thank you, Grain Millers. Um, and then uh, we also would like to thank our bronze sponsors, Sunrise International, uh, Duckfoot Parts, uh, ProCert Organics, and Weed Surfer. So thank you um, all for your support. And just a little bit about SASP Organics, who we are, what we do, uh, and, and the way we work. Um, again, I'm not going to read through the detail of that, but just wanted to throw that up on, on the screen just in case uh, folks aren't uh, familiar uh, with, with our organization. And now we'll get to why, uh, why we're all here this morning, our guest speakers. Uh, Martin Enns is Professor of Cropping Systems and Natural Systems Agriculture at the University of Manitoba, where he teaches at the diploma degree and graduate levels. Uh, Dr. Enns and his natural systems agricultural research team focus on designing sustainable, productive, and resilient agricultural systems that empower people. Their work started in the Prairie region, but has expanded to include activities in most provinces. Their anchor study, the Glen Lee Long-Term Rotation Experimented, located in southern Alberta, is Canada's longest-running comparison of organic and conventional production systems um, and they've been uh, doing that study since 1992. So with that uh, over to you Martin and thank you so much uh, for you and Will uh, being here today. Okay thank you very much. Good morning everyone. Um, I'm just uh, going to set up my screen and I'm going to ask Marla if she can hear me. I can hear you yes. Okay great. Okay, so, um, and you can see my screen? You can see your screen, yes. Okay, and great. Please. Yeah, perfect. Okay, all right. Um, I had my, there we go. I just lost my screen because I did something silly. I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really too bad. Uh, let me see. Um, hmm. This is embarrassing, but I suggest we have Will um, and I'll come after Will. Sorry okay. about that. Yeah, no, I don't know which one. no problem. I'm going to change it over to Will here. Okay. All right. Okay. okay so you can see my screen here. We sure yep. can, and we can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, and then let's just make sure did that slide transition well? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so hello everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Will Bailey Elkin. Um, as Martin mentioned, uh, I, I'm a graduate student uh, in the Department of Plant Science at the University of Manitoba. 
Um, and today I'll be talking about some of my master's research, which is on organic pea intercropping. Uh, a quick plug here, uh, that, that Twitter handle there is at systems ag underscore um, that's uh, the Natural Systems Agriculture Lab. So if you're interested in sort of following us and, and seeing what Martin's lab is up to throughout the growing season, it's a, it's a great place to, to start. So a little background about me. Um, I completed an undergraduate degree in sustainable agriculture at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Richmond, British Columbia. Um, I've worked on a number of, of mixed vegetable farms. Uh, I actually worked on, uh, for a short period of time, on an, an organic bison ranch uh, in southern Saskatchewan. And then in 2019, I, I became an IOIA trained organic inspector. And then in September of 2019, I began my master's at U of M under the supervision of, of uh, Dr. Renz. Uh, I always like to show these two photos here. So on the bottom left, that's a photo of, of some of our research plots in Richmond, BC. And it, I don't know if you know where Richmond is, but it's, it's just south of, of Vancouver. So it's right where, where the Fraser River opens up into the ocean. So we'd often be farming our research plots and you'd look up and you'd see these big freight ships passing by. Mm -hmm. probably, probably filled with bananas or some form of tropical fruit. And then on the right, these are my, my research plots this year in, in Carmen, Manitoba. So uh, two different, very different areas. <clears throat> so this short presentation, I'm gonna touch on, I'll go through the project background, a bit about the methods, um, and then discuss some of the 2019 results. So just about sort of how the project was mainly created. Uh, in general, we're seeing an increased demand for plant-based protein products. Uh, and then we're also seeing uh, uh, an increase in, in organic uh, pulse acreage as well. So from 2015 to 2018, there's a 117% growth in organic pulse acreage. Uh, so we went from around 88,000 acres of, of pulses in Canada to about 192,000 acres of organic pulses in, in the span of three years. And alongside this increase in organic pulse production, uh, we're also seeing more and more organic farmers intercropping two cro uh, cash crops. And, and generally one is, is, is often gonna be a pulse as well. Um, and I think mixed intercropping two cash crops uh, can, can sort of provide some of the same benefits that green manures and cover crops provide, but it also mitigates some of the issues associated with growing green manures and cover crops on the prairies. So, Obviously, with a full season green manure, the, there's no economic return during that growing season. And then with something like relay intercropping or relay cropping where, where you're maybe underseeding biennial clover with, with wheat, uh, sometimes you can end up with, with poor establishment in the second year. And then because of the lack of late season growing degree days and precipitation that exist across, exists across the Canadian prairies, double cropping can, can be difficult to execute. Uh, so an example of this would be if a green manure was planted immediately after the harvest of, uh, of your cash crop. So because of this, a, a big question that I often have is, if, is whether or not intercropping two cash crops is, is slowly going to replace the use of green manures and cover crops in organics. Um, so I'd like to uh, throw that question out to you guys as, as a polling question that you guys should be able to answer uh, through the, the, the platform here. Um, so in 2019, uh, an intercrop study was led by Dr. Martin Entz uh, and Michelle Karkner, uh, and their objective was to assess various pea intercrop seeding rate densities uh, with oat, barley, and mustard. Uh, I've taken this project over and I've built upon it. Uh, so we did three separate experiments. They were, they were conducted in 2019. One was a yellow pea barley intercrop trial. Uh, one was a yellow pea oat intercrop trial, and then one was a yellow pea mustard trial. Uh, the pea variety was uh, a semi-leafless yellow pea. Uh, it was the, the Amarillo variety. And our objectives were to quantify how increased seeding rates of barley, oats, and mustard affect pea growth and protein concentration. We wanted to quantify how increased seeding rates of barley, oats, uh, and mustard um, affect pea yield. 
Uh, we wanted to determine the, the weed suppression capabilities of increased seeding rates of barley, oats, and mustard when intercropped with peas. We wanted to also determine the disease suppression capabilities of increased seeding rates of barley, oats, and mustard when intercropped with peas. So this, this would be considered uh, an additive intercrop design. So the, the pea seeding rate was, was held at a constant of 120 plants per square meter, while the companion crop was seeded at varying percentages of their standard monocrop seeding rates. Uh, this would also be considered a, a mixed intercrop, where you have varying seeding rate densities uh, of the non-pea crop that were evenly distributed throughout the constant pea seeding rate. Uh, just as an example of, of the treatments, so these are the, the three different experiments here. You have the barley the, uh, intercrop, the oat intercrop, and the mustard intercrop. Uh, I'll touch on the barley intercrop where you have uh, the standard 100% seeding rate uh, of barley. We, we considered to be 300 plants per square meter, which is, is generally a common seeding rate for organics. So the, the, the four treatments would be as follows. Uh, you have a pea monocrop by itself, that same pea monocrop seeding rate with a 15% seeding rate of barley, pea monocrop with 25% seeding rate of barley, and then a pea monocrop with a 50% seeding rate of barley. Uh, and then with the oat intercrop trial and the mustard intercrop trial, you can see that, that the, the, the experimental design is the same in the sense that you're just increasing the percentages of the, of the seeding rate of the companion crop. Uh, so planting details, uh, because we're working with peas, uh, we wanted to work with uh, a low nitrogen field. Uh, the field tested about 52 pounds per acre nitrates. Uh, the previous crop had been oats. Uh, to prep the area, we did one pass with a cultivator. Uh, we seeded with a fab row plot seeder. Uh, we had 12 row plots, so that, that uh, ended up being six inch row spacing. Uh, we seeded uh, on May 10th. 2019. Uh, we did no pre-emerge weed management, uh, but we did do one inter-row cultivation just through the pea barley trial. Uh, and then we were able to harvest uh, August 6, 2019. So what was the 2019 growing season like? Uh, as many of you probably remember, we had a cool spring followed by a dry summer. Uh, and the overall uh, observations of the 2019 field trial was that the peas did relatively well due to the dryness as there was little disease pressure. Uh, the dry summer also seemed to limit the establishment of the companion crop in weeds and this potentially reduced competition with the pea crop. Um, these, these are three good photos of the three separate trials uh, at mid season at flowering. And then we also have the same plots uh, right before harvest. Um, and it, yeah, they all matured pretty evenly and we were able to harvest everything at the same time. And then these photos were actually taken yesterday. Uh, the, it's the same uh, mustard trial, but it's we're doing it again this year. Uh, and I think it just shows uh, the potential for, for ground cover and weed suppression that these intercrops can do. So you have on the left, the 25% mustard seeding rate, a uh, little bit of gra bare ground you can see. And then as you increase to the 75%, you can really see uh, a nice amount of cover on, that, on the ground. So now I'll touch on the, the 2019 results. Um, I'll start with the PO intercrop grain yield and biomass results. Uh, so the, the orange bar, it represents pea grain yield in kilograms per hectare. And the gray bar represents the companion crop grain yield in kilograms per hectare. Uh, the blue line represents weed biomass in kilograms per hectare. Uh, and what we saw is that uh, a 50% seeding rate of oats significantly reduced weed biomass from 896 kilograms per hectare to 397 kilograms per hectare. So, we had almost a, or over a 50% reduction in weed biomass with that 50% seeding rate of, of oats. In addition, a 50% seeding rate of oats significantly decreased pea grain yields from an average of 2,486 kilograms per hectare to an average of 1,293 kilograms per hectare. So quite a, quite a big reduction in, in pea yield. 
And while there were no significant differences in weed biomass, biomass when comparing the 15% and the 25% oat seeding rates to the pea monocrop, there is still a significant reduction in, in pea grain yield. So while, while all the treatments that contained oats significantly decreased pea grain yield, the 50% oat seeding rate was the only treatment that significantly decreased weed biomass as well. And we saw similar results with the pea barley, uh, but in this case, both the 25% and 50% barley intercrop significantly decreased weed biomass. Uh, and like, like the oat intercrop treatments, all three barley intercrop seeding rates significant, significantly reduced pea grain yield when compared to the pea monocrop grain yield. Uh, so while all the treatments that contain barley significantly decrease pea grain yield, the 25% and 50% barley seeding rates were the only treatments that would actually significantly decrease wheat biomass. Then finally, we have the, the pea mustard 2019 results. Uh, the, the pea mustard intercrop did not compete well with weeds, uh, with no significant differences in weed biomass among the different treatments. Unfortunately, this, the mustard did not do well, probably due to the lack of rain throughout mid-season and, and pretty heavy flea beetle pressure as well. Uh, this may explain the variability among the results where you can see that a 50% mustard seeding rate, the, the yield of mustard is, is, is very close to the yield the 75% mustard seeding rate had as well. Uh, now, with that being said, there was still a significant difference in pea grain yield between pea monocrop and 75% and mustard seeding rate. So in conclusion, um, yeah, I mean, it's always hard to make, you know, major conclusions and, and recommendations from, from one year's worth of data. Uh, but I think what this at least shows is that intercropping can allow an organic farmer to, to be adaptable to different situations and, and it may fit well into, into a, an integrated weed management approach as well. Uh, so, so we saw that varying proportions of intercrop barley and oats significantly reduced weed biomass in peas, but pea yield took a significant hit. Um, and so maybe if, if you know that every year you don't get around to a pre or post emergent harrow pass to manage weeds, or you don't have an implement to, to do inter row cultivation like a robo weeder, then the incorporation of a 25 to 50 percent seeding rate of barley or oats may be something uh, you, you could consider um, that, that does depend on, on the pea market price as well and, and the economics of it. Uh, thank you. And there's the, that's the Twitter handle as well, if you missed it before. Great. Thanks, Will. I just had one question come in, and they were wondering about the soil type that you were seeding into. Um, Carmen Manitoba, it's a pretty sa uh, sandy soil. Um, I don't know if I'd define it as a sandy loam, but it's quite sandy. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we're just, I'm just going to load up. Uh, Martin's presentation and we'll pass over to Martin. Great. Thanks a lot, Will. That was that was really fantastic. Uh, if I do say so myself. So um <laughs> or do I advance the slides myself? I think I will be Martin. So if you can okay. just Let's go to okay. the let's go to the, uh, let's go to the next slide then. Um, so um, yeah, thanks. That that was a you know that that project has been really interesting. It's been kind of focused on peas because of as Will explained. I want to just step back um, and uh, talk about mixing it up with uh, uh, not only grain intercrops but all but all crops. And um, the uh, picture that you have there is uh, green manure cover crop. And this this is a place where organic farmers have uh, have a lot of experience on, on growing green manures and mixtures, um, sometimes mixtures with weeds, uh, but off, you know, but, but also deliberate mixtures. And uh, if I could have the next slide, um, I, uh, in this slide, I'm, a, I'm actually jumping ahead to uh, sort of some of the contemporary thinking certainly in the black soil zone uh, of the prairies, uh, about what is possible uh, to, in terms of mixtures uh, with green manures. Um, and uh, this uh, is thanks to Scott Beaton, who farms um, 
about uh, 30 kilometers from Winnipeg. Uh, and uh, he says here that this is the best uh, green manure I've grown. And um, it is really quite a terrific looking crop. And I want to point out here that there are three functional groups of plants. So functional groups is uh, what we call um, species that do a particular thing, like legume is a functional group because it fixes nitrogen. Um, um, brassicas are a functional group because they're oil seeds and perennials are a functional group because they grow year after year or they might be low growing. Uh, oats is a different group because it's a grass. So here we have the legume faba bean at two bushels an acre, a bushel of oats, which is a grass, and then five pounds of a mixture of red and alcide clover. So th those are the three functional groups. And um, and you know the the green manure. You will and I are having a little contest here. You know he's going to replace green manures with intercropping, and here I'm talking about intercropping. So that's that's your healthy you know advisor student sort of sort of uh, competition. Um, but I, but I I think um, on the when we mix it up with the cover with the green manures, we we can be more productive than we often are right now. Um, and and uh, and so that's the point I wanted to make. Uh, I think if we're growing green manures and producing 4,000 pounds per acre of dry matter, you know that's really not economical. We need to get up to that six to eight thousand pounds per acre of of dry matter, maybe even higher, uh, to really get the amount of nitrogen to make that worthwhile. And I think mixtures in in the green manure year are really important. And that's my point with this slide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, uh, there is a lot of uh, innovation that's happening in cover cropping, not just, um, you know, full season cover cropping, which we as green manure, you know, as organic people call a green manure plow down. Um, and I just wanted to highlight three things. Uh, the first is that there's some really interesting late season cover crops that can help organic production. And uh, one that we've seen is, is fall rye working with pulses, whether it's fall rye before peas or fall rye before uh, dry beans or, for, or what has received the most attention in the United States for sure is fall rye before soybeans. And, um, and that's what this picture on the bottom left here is. In fact, uh, the left-hand side, what we did there is we seeded fall rye, uh, soybeans into the growing fall rye. And then when the fall rye had flowered, uh, we flail mowed it. And um, now that soybean crop doesn't look as good as the one on the right that uh, was um, fall rye and we, we tilled it and then seeded the soybeans. But there's fewer weeds in there. And if you have a lot of problem weeds, um, that no-till system, uh, you know, can be useful, um, and also it requires less tillage. So, so those are some things that I know farmers are thinking about. They're testing. If I could have the next slide, um, I'll show you something that for us has not worked, and that is growing um, a crop over top of a perennial. And I, I get calls from farmers. They say, you know, I want to seed my wheat into alfalfa or grass that I'm going to graze really close to the ground and um, and I, I've worked with that system here uh, also in Australia and in Australia it works quite well when you're dealing with a cool season perennial and you're growing or a, a warm season perennial I should say and you're growing cool season crops in the winter. We have not had a lot of success with that. So I just wanted to share that because we, we tried it with Cura Clover, we've also tried it with alfalfa. Uh, and some people might have success with it, but, but we've, never, we've never had, it's just too competitive. The perennial is too competitive. And the next slide, um, it, it actually shows, um, uh, you know, speaking of innovation and in cover cropping, it shows uh, that uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Yvonne Lawley at our university, is uh, really interested in learning from farmers. And so um, I'd encourage you to participate in the um, cover crop survey if you haven't already, uh, and you can learn what other farmers are doing. But the point here is that there's tremendous amount of innovation in cover cropping 
And, you know, we can hardly, we can't keep up with what farmers are doing. And that's a really good thing because farmers are experimenting and trying and making it work in their situation. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, maybe a, a last point on cover crops is what I really like about, now this is Scott Beaton's farm, uh, where he has pasture, so he has cover crops, which he has as a short-term perennial forage uh, for grazing. But um, what I think has really been exciting uh, with the cover crop dialogue and with the talk about organic regenerative agriculture is that um, we see the use of these, you know, mixtures in a farming systems context. And, you know, that is definitely back to the future. I tried to find a little um, extension bulletin picture uh, from Manitoba agriculture from 1950, which basically showed the same picture, but I couldn't find a good version of it, but I think I've made my point. So I'll go to the next slide. Next slide, yeah. So, so that's a little bit on cover crops and green manures. Uh, what I want to do in my remaining time is talk a little bit about, about grain intercropping, build on what, what Will has said, and then I want to just share some of the knowledge about mechanisms of intercrop. So, you know, here we have various intercropping systems that um, we've seen around the world, uh, and we know uh, we've done this for a long time, but there's renewed interest. So next slide, please. On the prairies, uh, there's been a lot of intercropping research that was started in the 1980s. And I just want to recognize some of the people who were uh, involved in that work. Um, and um, if I can have the next slide, please. It, I just want to run through a little bit of, of data that um, was generated. This here is work out of Saskatchewan. Some of you may remember the Innovative Acres program. This is on-farm data. This is where Lyle Cowell and um, uh, Chris Van Kessel uh, went to farms and they applied different levels of, of nitrogen fertilizer and then they measured this LER or land equivalent ratio, really asking the question, does this yield more than if we would have grown those two crops separately on half of each of the half of the field? And whenever that LER is bigger than one, that means you've had a yield advantage. And, you know, we can see that in the 80s with flax lentil in the Regina area and with pea canola in Meadow Lake, there were large increases uh, from uh, adding uh, the intercrop. And we also noticed that the intercrop advantage goes down as we add more nitrogen fertilizer. Very interesting. Um, so for organic production, this actually is an important lesson. Next slide. Um, this is some work. Um, at the University of Manitoba. This is John Waterer. Uh, and he showed he worked in 1990 and 1991 on mustard uh, pea intercrops and found that um, similar to what Will, you know, one year he had poor establishment and the LERs were about 1 to 1.17. And then when it established well in the following year, he had land equivalent ratios of 1.12 to 1.32. So, you know, this just demonstrates that that these intercrops have the potential to increase yield potential and you know that that's important next slide one of the other reasons um intercrops are useful as will mentioned is disease and at the top of the slide here i've written the yield strategy in monoculture has a problem and I think if we if we think about that, um, in certainly in conventional monocultures, you know, you how are we achieving higher yields? Well, we're we're putting for many crops, we're adding more plants, we're increasing our plant density, we're at we're certainly adding more nutrients, and all of that leads to more biomass. And uh, we know the 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 grain to straw ratio has gone up, the harvest index in our crops has gone up but we're still relying on increased biomass production to, to increase our crops, certainly with things like cereals um, and, uh, and many pulses. And, you know, one of the problems is you create this very dense canopy of all the same species 
and it results in more leaf diseases. And this is one of the reasons why in conventional agriculture, fungicides have become so popular because the, the, the canopies are, are, you know, there's dew in the canopies many, many hours of the growing season. So can intercropping reduce this? And so if you go to the next slide, um, this shows the uh, uh, graduate student who worked with me in the early 2000s, Jackie Pridham. Um, she, uh, I want to give her credit for getting us started in intercropping. She was very keen to work on intercropping uh, and um, came to the University of Manitoba to do that. And we looked at a number of different intercrop combinations, which you can see on the on the left. Uh, and uh, but I I wanted to first point out um, the uh, the two rows at the bottom, the half rate wheat and the full rate wheat. And you can see the the um, the number there is the per percent leaf area covered by disease. Um, so the LAC uh, and uh, we can see that as we go from the half rate to the full rate of wheat, we always increase the disease. So that really makes, you know, proves that as we have a thicker canopy, we're gonna have more leaf disease. And um, what we observed in our study is that the wheat pea intercrop was actually the one that quite consistently reduced our leaf disease in wheat. So that was interesting. Um, you may see that you have a wheat flax one there in 2005 at Carmen that did really well. Well, we goofed up on the seeding rate of the flax, and I think it was like three times the normal seeding rate. So in a very high seeding rate of flax and wheat, yes, we can also reduce our leaf diseases in wheat there as well. Next slide, please. But when we looked at the economics of those intercrops in that particular study anyways, which was done at three different site years, um, we didn't see a large economic advantage over, uh, in, uh, you know, of growing intercrops over the full rate of wheat. Uh, and I know this webinar is recorded and you can go back and look at this data on your own if you'd like to study it in greater detail. But, uh, so that's why the paper, um, we concluded that intercropping spring wheat with cereal grains, legumes, and oil seed fails to improve productivity under organic management. Um, it did give us some weed control benefits and some disease benefits, but we didn't really improve the economics, at least in this case. Next slide. Okay, I want to just address some specific questions around intercropping. And the first one is, does um, nitrogen transfer, let's say from Will's, you know, pea crops to his barley crops. Is that possible? And if I could have the next slide. Um, you know, the answer is yes. And here's just the proof. We've got um, uh, a number of studies cited here where um, if we look, for example, at the second paragraph there, uh, working in Scandinavia, Jensen found that barley gets 19% of its nitrogen from intercropped peas when grown together for 70 days. That's kind of our length of our period where the crops would grow together. Swatsky and Soper observed the same thing in Manitoba, but they observed that, well, I'll, sh I'll talk about the mechanisms later. And then um, Zhao and Li observed legumes contributed about 15% of nitrogen to intercrop cereal. And they did that work in China. Um, and so, so the answer to this question is, is yes, uh, some transfer can occur. And if I could have the next slide, what I'm gonna do is talk about the mechanism. Um, there are a number of different ways the nitrogen gets from the legume to the non-legume. Um, here is an example of white clover in a pasture situation. So that Tom et al in 1994 observed that nitrogen can directly transfer through the mycorrhizal fungal network from the legume to the grass, from the white clover to the ryegrass. And then Wally, Fran Wally at the University of Saskatchewan was working on this question as well in a pasture situation, uh, alfalfa brome, and um, observed that there was also nitrogen transfer, but in this case, the legume deposited the nitrogen into the soil, organic matter, and then it was mineralized out of there in, and then the grass took it up. So there's, these are just a couple of the mechanisms by which nitrogen can transfer. 
and it does occur in grain legumes as well, not just perennial pastures. Next slide, please. So the next question about mechanisms is, does intercropping increase nitrogen fixation in legumes? And the answer is, that, is yes, it can. And so what we have here in this review paper is um, uh, 26 different scenarios of intercrops from all over the world. Um, in North America, there's some African, uh, and there are there are the data from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba in there as well. And on the bottom right, I've got a circle, and I've calculated the average uh, percent nitrogen fixed. Um, and, and what the scientists do is they look at the nitrogen that comes into that legume, and through tracing uh, technology, um, isotopic tracing, they can determine how much of that nitrogen came from actual nitrogen fixation and how much of it came from the soil. Because legumes are very good at taking up soil nitrogen as well. And what they found is that in monocrops, 49.8% uh, of the nitrogen came from fixation. But when those same legumes were grown in an intercrop, that percentage of nitrogen fixation went up to 61.5%. So we're getting a you know 11% increase in nitrogen fixation uh, when we intercrop those legumes with a non-legume. It puts more pressure on the plant to make its own nitrogen, and that's a, that that we can use that to our advantage. Okay, next question. Next slide. So. Another question is what happens to carbon when the roots mingle? Let's let's think about below ground, you know, when you know this is what what always you know interests farmers, you know, what's happening below ground, what's happening in the soil? I've got these, you know, plant mixtures. And uh, and roots intermingle and they're always interacting and they're always talking to each other through chemical means and other means. And if you go to the next slide, I wanted to show. A, an example out of the scientific literature and uh, the reference is given on the bottom if people want to look up the paper uh, but what uh, was this is a fascinating study where they looked at flax growing by itself on the left sorghum growing by itself on the right and then in the middle they mixed the two now these are both mycorrhizal plants these are both species that associate, associate with, with the beneficial uh, fungi called mycorrhiza. And um, so the CMN there stands for the Common Mycorrhizal Network. And what they discovered, if you look at the, the flax in the middle, it's way bigger than the flax on the left. And uh, what they discovered is that when sorghum was growing with flax, sorghum uh, increased flax's growth by 46%. And what happened is they were shifting carbon through the mycorrhizal network from the sorghum plant to the flax plant, because sorghum produces lots of excess carbon and flax is, you know, we all know flax, it's a bit wimpy. Um, but, fla uh, you know, what was the cost of the sorghum plant? It was 7% of its growth. So a 7% reduction in the sorghum growth resulted in, in a 46% increase in growth for the flax. So the net benefit is, um, is obvious. Now this happens when plants associate with mycorrhiza and many of the crop plants that we grow do. All legumes do, most cereals do. Wheat doesn't do it as well as oats and doesn't do it as well as corn or or sorghum, um, brassicas don't associate with mycorrhiza, neither does red root pigweed. So, um, you know, we, we, you can get that list on the internet quite easily. One, one other question before I leave this slide is, you know, why do these um, mycorrhiza even want to connect different plant species? Like what's, what's in it for them? Um, and what's in it for them is insurance. Uh, the mycorrhizal fungi get carbon from these plants. So the plants are the energy source for the fungus. And 
um, you know, they, they don't just want to rely on one species, so they tap into different species just in case one does better than the other. And so we get these common mycorrhizal networks establishing in our fields all the time. And it, you, you have heard it said that tillage reduces or destroys mycorrhiza. Um, it reduces it, but it hardly eliminates it. There's many other factors that affect these, and all organic fields have quite good levels of mycorrhizal fungi. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've talked about nitrogen, we've talked about carbon. What about water? What happens to water or water-related things when roots intermingle? Let's have the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, one of the questions that people have asked is um, if, if you have an intercrop and one of your plants is really good at picking out that water stress is coming, does it communicate that to the other plant to help it prepare itself? Um, can other stresses be communicated between plants, can unstressed plants respond to stress cues emitted from stressed neighbors? Well, you know, the answer is yes. Uh, you, can, you, you will always find studies where this happens. The, the problem is we haven't done a lot of this work in our agricultural intercrops. And, um, but I can only imagine that it's part of the reason why we get over yielding. So if I get to the next slide, um, this, this next slide um, uh, is from a fairly complicated study, but if you look at the bottom right, where it says 60 minutes, um, it, you it, what it's showing there is the, the, the width of the stomates. Now, st st stomata or stomates, they're, they um, are on the leaves of the plant, both on the upper leaf and the lower leaf surface, and um, and they they open up um, like this to let water out and let CO2 in. And when it gets water stressed, they close or they become less open. And um, and what happened here is um, there was an intercrop and and the neighboring plant was stressed and they were wondering if the other plant uh, would um, would pick up uh, would pick up that stress response. And the long and the short of it is that it did. So, um, you know, what are some of the intercrops that we grow that might be early indicators of stress? You know, which plants, uh, which plants tend to wilt easily? I mean, if we look at brassicas, we know that uh, they, mustard, for example, they will wilt pretty readily. Certainly canola does, wilts very readily when it's uh, in midday stress. So is it communicating to the pea crops to do something? Um, you know, I, that's research that I look forward to. Next slide, please. Um, since we're talking about below ground things and in intercropping, um, I wanted to remind us that, um, that what happens below ground, what happens uh, with root growth is really dependent on the soil condition. And it can change with the crop rotation, the, the amount of compaction in the field, the water content, and the nutrient distribution. And this research here shows that on the left-hand side, when soil resources are abundant, you know, plants allocate less biomass to their roots. Um, and so uh, sometimes we're, you know, in organic agriculture, people are, are, you know, concerned about lower levels of certain nutrients. Well, maybe that's actually helping our, helping our roots grow, uh, grow better, grow more root hairs. And, um, and then on the right-hand side, it shows uh, that where the nutrients are can affect the root proliferation. So last year, for example, if you were growing a green manure, you worked it down and then you, you know, we had six inches of rain in the fall. Um, we definitely are gonna have some downward movement of that nitrogen. That's gonna affect the way that root looks this year versus maybe the way it looked two years ago. So this is one of the explanations as to why mixing it up doesn't always give the same result um, because uh, the soil condition can be different from year to year. Next slide, please. Now we're still on the topic of what happens uh, to uh, water when roots intermingle. And um, 
another phenomena that occurs that we know occurs, there's lots of scientific literature on this, is that deep rooted plants can actually lift water from lower down, bring that water up to the root zone of companion plants and deliver that water to those plants. And uh, this is also an area that we haven't done as much research as we should have, but I think the interest in cover cropping and in intercropping is driving this interest. So if I could have the next slide, I wanna give you an example where the research has been done. And um, it's been done with, with uh, semi-perennial legumes like pigeon pea, and especially pigeon pea, and lab lab in uh, tropical uh, areas um, like Afri as tropical Africa. And so this is some work that we had um, the privilege of being involved in. On the left, we see a lab lab uh, maize intercrop and um, under you know, quite good moisture conditions. Um, and the, the lab lab is, uh, is a plant with very drought tolerant, very deep roots. And uh, um, we, know, we know the plant like lab lab, which is pigeon pea also used in this connection. Uh, is uh, the, the water lifting capacity of that plant has been documented. On the top right is a, is a farmer. She was growing lab lab under extremely dry conditions in, in Kenya. And the only reason that lab lab would do that well is, is because it has those deep roots to go get the water. Now, what are our crops that have deep roots to go get water? You know, that's a good question. Um, certainly alfalfa, and that's why we are interested in growing crops over top of perennials, which in our case didn't work. <laughs> but uh, you can see the, the, the logic. Uh, maybe there's other ways of organizing that. Um, maybe brassicas, um, you know, mustards, uh, very good at getting water. Sunflower, um, you know, those are the type of crops that I think about. Maybe safflower. And uh, just to show you that there are limits to this system, on the bottom right of this, um, slide is a picture from our droughted site in western Zimbabwe and we have pretty I mean the lab lab is alive it's the the, the rows of legumes there and uh, but the maze between the rows of lab lab is dead uh, it's not going to amount to anything and um, so you know the lab lab clearly didn't lift enough water to keep that that maze going um, but at least there's something to harvest and there's something to eat because the lab lab produces nice seeds and you can see the seeds in the, in the slide. So the whole idea of water lifting, I mean, when I hear about some of the innovative cover crop systems that uh, I've heard from the Axtons and other people in, um, in the dry areas of the Southern Prairies, I go to myself, I think, oh, how much water lifting is going on? There may be more than we think. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to end off just with a couple of uh, comments about uh, another type of mixing up, and that's variety mixes. Um, there's There's been a, a lot of interest in variety mixtures uh, all over the world uh, with rice uh, in Asia, with uh, barley in Eastern Europe. Um, and if you go through the literature, you can see that variety mixtures can provide some stability and com, com, can combine, can provide some benefits. Um, we've done quite a bit of work on variety mixtures in wheat, and we have uh, not seen a lot of benefits. Um, if, you, if you put up the next slide, um, um, I'll show you some of the theory that we were thinking about as we, um, as we think about variety mixtures. Um, so here is an example from rice, and it asks the question, do plants respond differently to relatives and unrelated plants? And the answer was yes. This study showed that roots tend to avoid roots that they are not that are not related. So what we have here on the left is the same genotype or the same variety of rice growing together. There's two different varieties, variety A and variety B, and you can see those roots are, are intermingled. And then in the examples on the right, C and D, they looked at different varieties. So within C and within D, there, those were varieties were different. And those roots actually didn't touch. And so that's the theory of variety. That's one of the theories of variety mixtures is 
is can we um, put, let's say, two varieties of barley together, two varieties of oats, and maybe they'll explore the soil more efficiently because they're not going to touch. Um, well, um, uh, you know, now, are variety mixtures worth trying? I, th I think if I look at the literature, I'd say that as long as it doesn't affect the marketing of your crop, uh, it's not a bad idea. Uh, as long as the maturity is similar, uh, it can be a very good idea um, because of disease resistance and other things um, in certain cases. If I can go to the le next slide, I'll show you what we found in some of our variety mixture work. Um, and that is, if you go to the right-hand column, where we're looking at um, combined yield, um, what we find is that there's really no benefit of uh, two-way mixtures or three-way variety mixtures. Um, now, this is among the mixtures that, that Jackie Pridham tested in her master's work. So it's only a snapshot of what's out there. Um, but uh, we didn't see a, a yield boost. We saw that the varieties made a difference. Uh, the variety at the bottom, AC Berry, yielded significantly less than a uh, than 5602HR, which was one of the first fusarium toler moderately tolerant varieties. So maybe that's a, a reason why it's, uh, the variety selection is important. And this work was done a long time ago, so that we've now got different varieties. But but I do want to go to the next slide and show you one of the things that we did learn out of variety mixtures. And um, and uh, it's it's very curious uh, what we've seen here. But if you look at the right hand column, let's look at Carmen, uh, nine, 2005. We look right at the bottom. We look at, we see AC Berry, and we see again the disease, the percentage of the leaf area that's diseased. It's 97%. So 97% of the leaves, the flag leaves, had leaf spotting diseases, tan spot, septoria on them. And if we go right to the top, there's red fife, <laughs> and uh, it has significantly less leaf disease. Very odd. Uh, and so what we learned here is that uh, it that it 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 um, uh, red fife. Uh, if we look at you know Carmen 2004 at the middle middle column, you can see 22% leaf disease of red fife and 89% on AC berry. Uh, and 61% on the, the better um, uh, 5602HR. So uh, Steve Shirtliff from the University of Saskatchewan gave a lecture once, I think it was called The Curious Case of Red Fife. And you know, why is this ancient variety actually resistant to these leaf diseases? Uh, and it, it may be because it hasn't been grown for 100 years, um, at least on a large scale, that um, the leaf diseases that we have now uh, no longer affected and it will be susceptible in the future to new leaf diseases uh, because it doesn't have the leaf, uh, it doesn't have the resistance genes uh, for leaf leaf rust um, and others. But um, uh, again, here we saw no effect of the mixtures on leaf diseases, but any, any mixture with red fife in it had less disease. So I'm going to wrap up with the last slide. Um, the um, just next slide, please. I um, just wanted to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I know that uh, we've asked the organizers to, to get you to pose questions. And Will and I will look at your questions. We'll answer them as best you can. We'll send them to Sask Organics and they will um, uh, post them. Um, and maybe there's a little bit of time for discussion. I'm not sure. I'm sorry that um, I wasn't able to handle the slides, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Martin um, and Will. Um, we do have one, one question. Everybody's been pretty quiet on the question front. I think uh, they were listening intently to the, uh, the, or to the, to the presentation, so uh, maybe we'll need a little bit of time to digest uh, what they've heard before there are questions. So I just want to say, if you do have questions, you know, following the webinar, um, please send them, send them to uh, Sask Organics at admin at saskorganic.com. Um, I do have one question here, and it's for Will. Uh, and the question is, any interest or research on intercrop cash crops, for example, forage seed ryegrass with an oil seed or cereal. Uh, do we know anything about what goes on below the ground? Um, or a red 
Alsike, A L S I K E clover with a cereal, e.g., oats. So clover with oats. And then what was the other one? The first? Uh, like a rye, a rye grass with an oil seed or cereal. Rye with oil seed. Um, I personally haven't come across any research. Uh, maybe I'll pass that to you, Martin. I, you might mm -hmm. have some understanding. Uh, there was quite a bit of work done uh, at the, our university with uh, looking at rye grass as a cover crop in soybeans and dry beans. Um, so soybeans is an oil seed, um, and uh, not with I don't think with mustard. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, perennial rye grass under sown to or late season sown into soybean, and then for a perennial rye grass seed crop the next year. That worked really well, actually. I don't know what the below ground processes were there. Um, as far as alcyc clover with cereals, alcyc is a is a very nice uh, um, forage. That's actually what Scott Beaton used with his faba bean oat uh, green manure mixture. So alcyc is very flooding tolerant. Um, I, I don't know if cattle really love it, but uh, it's a very good green manure. All right. And below ground on the alcyc, I should just say it's a little bit more of a rhizomatous type of fibrous root system, um, as opposed to alfalfa, which is very, which tends to be very tap rooted. So uh, that that can be a real advantage. Excellent, thank you. And I'm just going to check the questions one more time uh, to see if there are any more questions that come in, and it and it doesn't look like it for now. Um, so with that. Um, we'll bring the uh, bring the webinar uh, to a close. Uh, thank our sponsors again uh, for for their support. Um, thank all of all of you who have attended today. We're really grateful for that, and and a big thank you to Martin uh, and Will for spending some time with us this morning and sharing what uh, you you're learning uh, there at uh, in at. On, you know, at, at your at your place there in Manitoba, um, I have tweeted out um, asking everybody to follow uh, your um, your new Twitter handle there because I think it will be really valuable uh, information, and it seems increasingly that that's uh, the way that a lot of farmers are uh, accessing. Uh, information at least at that top level so that they can dig a little deeper so I uh, just would encourage everybody to follow um, to follow the uh, U of M natural systems agriculture and with that uh, the last note to say is that you will receive a recording uh, of the webinar uh, which is really great because there was a lot of uh, detailed uh, information shared as well so you can study that at your uh, leisure um, and that will come out uh, in the next 24 hours or so. So thank you again, everybody, for being here today. And uh, next week, it's the bee's knees. So join us uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, wild bee diversity and how you can uh, build habitats on your farm to encourage um, more bees to show up. So thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye.